at our Bibles this morning and uh, turn to 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings chapter 21. And uh, before we get into God's word this morning, let's bow our heads and let's pray and let's ask the Lord to give us his blessing as we open up his word together. Father in heaven, we come before you and we are thankful for this inspired, perfect word that you have in grace given to us. We thank you, Lord, that you have not left us to navigate life by our own notions, by our own opinions and ideas, which are subject to such winds of change and public opinion and mood, but that you've given us this authoritative word to guide us in every area, not only of faith, but of life. And for that, we give you thanks, Lord. And we ask that you would strengthen us today to look carefully and to look uh, with passion at your word and to glean from it the way of life Change us to be more like Jesus as a result of opening up God's word together. May Christ be glorified here among us and may we be drawn closer to him. Lord, speak to hearts, save the lost, strengthen every Christian, and I pray that the same would take place in our children's ministries today. Be with Mary as she works with our young ones and turn their eyes to Jesus from the very first time that they understand. We commit all these things to you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. As we've been going through this series on Elijah, uh, and we've been away from it for a couple of weeks. Of course, last week was Mother's Day. The week before, we were in 1 Kings 20, uh, just because I, I didn't feel right about skipping over 1 Kings 20, even though Elijah is not in 1 Kings 20. So, uh, so now we're back on track in our, in our study of Elijah. One of the things that has stood out to me in this study that has not really stood out as much in years past to me is this very strange relationship between Elijah and Ahab. A very strange, a very a complicated relationship. In 1 Kings 17... Elijah went to him, and uh, we first meet Elijah when he goes to Ahab and tells him that the reason it hasn't rained for six months, and it's not going to rain for another three years, is that I have prayed that God would do what he promised he would do, that if the nation turned away to idolatry, that you would judge by withholding the rain. And Elijah said, I've prayed for that, and that's why it hasn't rained in six months, and it's going to continue not to rain. The Lord then whisks Elijah away to a deserted place for the rest of the time of this divine judgment. I don't think that the Lord whisked him away to protect him. I think the Lord whisked him away to prepare him for what was ahead. So he sends them, to, sends to Elijah to this deserted place. In chapter 18, Elijah comes to Ahab, and Ahab addresses Elijah as the troubler of Israel. And Elijah re responded to him, I'm not the one who is troubling the nation. It is you, and you're, uh, you're leading the nation into idolatry, and that is what has brought trouble upon the nation. After the prophets of Baal are killed at Mount Carmel, Ahab reported, uh, reported what happened to his wife Jezebel. It wasn't Ahab that threatened and pronounced death, a, a death sentence on Elijah. It was Jezebel that made that proclamation. 
So it's all, it almost seems to me, and my reading on this may be not perfect, but I, I, it feels to me like Ahab realizes that this is a true man of God. But Ahab is unwilling to rock the boat of the path that he himself has put the nation on by bringing in Jezebel. She is, a, she is from Phoenicia. He brings her in and he allows her to come with her whole entourage of, uh, of idolatrous priests and prophets. And Elijah, or Ahab doesn't want to rock the boat. Kind of reminded of the very strange relationship that existed between the great preacher of uh, one of the preeminent preachers of the Great Awakening. His name is uh, George Whitfield. You probably heard that name. And God used George Whitfield in a powerful way in this country. George Whitfield had a very strange friendship with Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was not a Christian. He was a he was a deist. Uh, Abraham, uh, excuse me, Benjamin Franklin believed in God. He believed in a God, but he believed in a God who stood aloof from creation. Uh, as one person said, you know, a deist is kind of like uh, a, a deist concept of God is about like the concept of the Queen of England. She reigns, but she does doesn't rule. She is a figurehead and she reigns, she, but doesn't rule in the day-to-day -day events. Well, that's kind of the, the idea that Benjamin Franklin had of God. So Benjamin Franklin was a, uh, he believed in a God. He was not a believer, though. Um, Whitfield routinely pressed Franklin as, you know, Whitfield would go and he would preach the gospel and, and beckon people to respond and accept Jesus. And he constantly pressed Benjamin Franklin about his need to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Franklin said this, quote, he, he used indeed sometimes to pray for my conversion, but he never had the satisfaction of believing that his prayers were heard. Wow. He knew that his friend, ben, uh, his friend George Whitfield constantly was telling him they needed to be saved, but he never had the satisfaction of knowing those prayers were, ans were answered. So he was intrigued. He was interested. He, he saw the benefit of Christianity, but he was never converted. And it seems to me that Ahab was in that same boat. In chapter 20, the Lord gave Israel, gave uh, Ahab a miraculous deliverance from the Syrians. But Ahab made the mistake after the Syrians were delivered into his hands. Ahab spared King Ben-Hadad and brought, uh, because he disobeyed God by sparing King Ben-Hadad, he brought the Lord's punishment down on himself. And that's what chapter 20 ended with. Now on the heels of the Lord's message of punishment to Ahab because he spared Ben-Hadad, Ahab wanted to drown out his sorrow, wanted to drown out the pangs of his conscience, and he tried to do it in the same way that very often you and I try to drown out sorrows and pangs of conscience. He said, you know what? I think I'd just feel much better if I went out and got some stuff. And that's what chapter 20, uh, 21 begins with. So we're going to read 1 Kings chapter 21. Now it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near, next to my house, and for it I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. 
But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So what's Naboth saying there? It's not just saying I don't want to. He said the Lord does not allow me to do that. The command was that their, their, their property, their family inheritance was to stay in that family. And that was an important thing. So Naboth responds, this is against God's law. Ahab, you are the king, but you cannot defy God's law. So Ahab went into his house, sullen and displeased. Same phrase is used at the end of chapter 20. Uh, chapter 20, verse 43, the king of Israel went to his house, sullen and displeased. Ahab went into his house, sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father's. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, said to him, uh, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. So the men of his city, the elders and nobles who were the inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had said to them, as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them, they proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth with high honor among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him, and the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. And, they've took the, and they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned, and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which refused to give you for money, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive but dead. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to me with Ahab the king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, shall lick your blood, even yours. So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will, I will take away your posterity and will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the son of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord spoke, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air eat whoever dies in the field. 
But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and put, on, and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. This is a very vivid and very tragic passage. Although it's vivid, it's hard to comprehend how a king sitting on the throne of the nation could descend so low in such viciousness and in pettiness. I'll give you a quotation. It's actually in the bullets in there. And understand this is a, a quotation that is, it's a, the statement is not original to me. In fact, we don't even know who said it first. It says, uh, sin will take you farther than you want to go, will keep you longer than you want to stay, and will cost you more than you ever expected to pay. It was Ahab. He didn't expect that sin would take him to the place where he sits today. He has viciously brought about the murder of a good man, Naboth, just so that he could take possession of his land. Here's the king. He has sprawling gardens, but he always just needs what belongs to the next door neighbor, right? Ahab never intended to be where he was at this day toward the end of his life. You know, sin is like the tides at the beach. You know, I, some of you, my, because of my pasty white skin, that's some place I try to stay away from. But some of you may enjoy going to the beach. I used to when I was a kid. That's probably why I'm trying to have do treatments right now. But, you know, you, you go out to the beach and you go out in the water. And if you stay out in the water for a long time, especially if you're a be like a beach that at horse neck, what do you have to do? You got to keep an eye on the shore, don't you? Make sure you keep an eye on where you started because it doesn't take long before completely unknown to you, you could get swept down the beach and all of a sudden you come back and your towel and you, all your stuff is, you, you have no whether no idea whether you go left or right to find it sin is like that sin takes us imperceptibly it drags us down the road slowly to hell imperceptibly but it drags us down that road certainly Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22 speaks of the deceitful desires of sin Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13 speaks of the deceitfulness of sin. Understand something, and we have all, every one of us in this room can give testimony to this. When, when the devil tempts us to sin, it's just like it was in the Garden of Eden. There's always big promises, right? Always this is going to make you feel so fulfilled. It's going to give you such satisfaction. It is going to fill up what is lacking in your life. Just like the devil told Eve, just eat of this fruit. You're going to be like God. God is trying to keep you down. God's trying to keep you away from true happiness. You eat of this fruit, you'll have it. Immediately when she and Adam sinned, they felt not a fulfillment. That it, They felt an overwhelming vacancy. That's what sin does, doesn't it? Sin never delivers what it promises. It always leaves you uh, barren. It always leaves you empty and so much worse off than you were to begin with. That's why 
The Bible speaks of sin in its deceitful desires. Deceitful desires always disappoints. There's not a person in this room that has ever sinned and been happy you did it. Never. We see some uh, vivid pictures in this passage of just how deceptive sin is. Number one, sin deceives us with materialistic desires. Sin deceives us with materialistic desires. What did Jesus say? Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. I referred to that passage last week. You cannot serve God and mammon. We think of mammon strictly in terms of money. Mammon is bigger than money. Mammon is that which we can get, what we think we can get from this world, from people around us, from ourselves, whether it be by money or whether it be by time or whether it be by work, Mammon is that which we can get from sources other than God. You cannot serve God and mammon. The chapter starts out with Ahab, sullen and displeased. This unnamed prophet has come to him and given him a hard message at the end of chapter 20. Now the question is, you and I, what do we do when we are in the place where Ahab was that day? What do we do when we're down? What do we do when we are sullen and, and displeased? Common wisdom. What does this world tell us? You look to all of the self-help resources that, that we stockpile around us. This world tells us, you know, you'll feel better if you can just take your mind off of your troubles for a little while, right? You'll feel so much better. You know, maybe what you need to do, what did Ahab do? Ahab went walking around looking for property to get. You'll feel so much better if you just go out and buy some stuff. Won't you feel better if you go shopping? I can tell you, I never feel better when I go shopping. I feel much worse when I go shopping. Much worse. But you'll feel much better if you just go out. Take a little shopping spree. It'll make you feel so much better. At least until you get the credit card bill. Cheer yourself up with stuff. You know, we get down, we get disappointed, we get depressed. What is your knee-jerk reaction when you feel depressed? Maybe you surround yourself with two of your best friends, Ben and Jerry. Maybe that's what you do. And a pint of their best offerings. Maybe that's it. Maybe you sit down on the couch and binge watch some show on television. Maybe for you, you would just rather go to sleep for a while. Take a vacation. Some people might in those moments turn to things like alcohol, other, subst other substances like drugs or pornography, illicit relationships. I mean, the list could go on and on and on. Sometimes we take what is even might be good things, but we try to take those good things and put them in a place that only belongs to God. When we are sullen, when we are displeased, what does Psalm 42 say? Why are you disquieted? Why are you, why are you distressed, O oh my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? And what is the answer? Hope in God. When we are displeased, when we're struggling, we need to get to God. We need to ask Him to strengthen us during those times, not looking to all of these things, which even good things, you put them in the place of God, they will never, they will never satisfy you. Your spouse is a wonderful blessing from God to you. Your spouse was not intended to sustain you when you are struggling. Food is a gift from God. It is never meant to make us happy when we're struggling. That is a place that only belongs to God. We give in to this same wrong thinking that Ahab had. We will never be satisfied with what we can get from this world and from other people or even from ourselves. 
We cannot serve God and mammon. But that's how deceitful sin is. There's not a person in this room that has not struggled with that temptation. Maybe I could say it this way. There's not a person in this room that has not struggled with that temptation this month. Maybe I could even say this week. Well, this is the first day of the week. Last week. Last week. At the peak of his wealth, John D. Rockefeller had a net worth of about 1% of the entire U.S. economy. John D. Rockefeller owned 90% of the oil and gas industry in his day. Compared to all of the, the who's who among the rich people in the world today, they would all be not too well off when compared to, uh, comparatively speaking, to John D. Rockefeller. But when, at, when somebody asked John D. Rockefeller, how much is enough? You've probably heard this quotation before. He said, just a little more. Just a little more. You know how true that is? No matter how much you have, it'll never satisfy you. And no matter how much God blesses you with, if you're looking to get satisfaction from this stuff, it is always going to leave you saying, you know what? I'd be so much happier if I just had a little more. Everything of this world is about like the pints of your favorite ice cream as you're digging down into that pint, right? You know, you, you're digging down into that pint of cookies and cream and you, you get about halfway through that thing and say, you know what? Uh, it's enough. That's enough. One more taste and I'm done. I'm going to put it back in the freezer. But then you take that spoon out, you dig down a spoon, what do you say? Ooh, there's an Oreo there. Yeah, one more. And you take that, oh, God, just one, and before you know it, it's all gone, right? I don't speak from experience. I do, but uh, that's the way sin is, right? Just a little more, just a little more, just a little more, and before you know you're in the grips of the devil. Ahab is sullen and he's displeased. And the next thing you know, the vast sprawling property of the king of Israel, he looks around and says, ah, this isn't enough. This isn't enough. What do I need? Well, the next door neighbor, Naboth, he's got a little vineyard there. Wouldn't it be so nice if I could just open up the fence and just kind of bring that property into mine, it would make my property so much more enjoyable. The grass is always greener on the other side, right? My neighbor's property is always just a little bit better. They got a better view. Their soil is clearly much better. They don't have as much leaves. That's what Ahab falls to. The reality is it's about like the person dying of thirst, trying to quench that thirst with seawater. And in the moment, it seems right. In the moment, it seems, at least for a second anyways, like it's, it's quenching your thirst. But all the while, it is killing you and leaving you wanting more. Ahab was right to be sullen and displeased. He should have been sullen and displeased. He's living in open rebellion against God, and he is suffering the terrible consequences of his sin. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, quote, Pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Ahab is right to be sullen and displeased. But that sullenness, that displeasure should have pushed him to only what God could have given him. In our times of sorrow and disappointment, what do we need to do? We need to look up. We need to hear the voice of God shouting out to us in our disappointments, in our displeasures, our pain. Instead of humbling himself in repentance, Ahab tried to drown out his sorrow with the quick fix of getting a nice piece of land. Jeremiah said in chapter 2 and verse 13 of his prophecy, he spoke of the double sin of the people of God. 
that they had forsaken God, the fountain of living waters, and they were instead trying to satisfy themselves by digging out broken cisterns which were not able to hold any water. What's Jeremiah saying? You have forsaken the living waters, the flowing, refreshing waters of God, and you think you can put a straw to the mud puddles and be satisfied. It's foolish. That's what sin does. Sin deceives us into thinking we can be satisfied with it, and it always disappoints. It disappointed Adam and Eve, it disappointed Ahab, and it disappoints you, and it disappoints me. What is the sin that has left you disappointed in recent days? Let's identify it in our own hearts and minds. Call it for what it is. Recognize sin in all of its deceitful pleasures. Number two, sin de de deceives with misplaced blame. Sin deceives with misplaced blame. Elijah came to Ahab, and Ahab called him what? My enemy. My enemy. In chapter 18, verse 17, he called Elijah the one who was troubling the nation. The reality was that Elijah was the only one. Well, the other prophet told, Elijah, told uh, Ahab the truth also, but Elijah was the one who was telling Ahab the truth. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know what you need? You know what I need? We need people around us who love us enough to tell us the truth. We need people around us who love us enough to tell us the truth, even when we don't want to hear the truth. Do you have somebody in your life like that? There's a temptation when someone loves you enough to tell you the truth. Sometimes you get to a spot where you don't want to hear it. Ahab didn't want to hear the truth. That's why he called Elijah my enemy. Elijah was the best friend Ahab had. Remember that old story we heard as we were kids? The emperor's new clothes. Remember that one? Here's this guy, this king. He's walking around buck naked. He's got all the yes men around him. And he says to them, how about my new clothes? Oh, it's beautiful. Never seen you wear such nice clothes. They just didn't want to tell him the truth. Oh, by the way, you're not wearing any clothes. You know what? We live in a world where we have defined love as this. That no matter how bad something is in somebody's life, no matter how far off base, no matter how deluded a life they are living, that true love is just telling them everything's okay, even when it is terribly not okay. That is not love. That is hatred. It's hatred in its highest form, telling someone everything is okay when it is not okay. Sin deceives us with misplaced blame. Things were not going well in the nation. And it was easy for Ahab to look around and blame the one person who was willing to tell him the truth. You know, we use that cliche, you gotta tell someone bad news and what do you say? Don't shoot the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. So we, we, we tend to respond in a, in a tough way toward the person who is just coming to tell us what is the truth or what the message is. Elijah was not the origination of the message. Elijah was the messenger of God. He wasn't making up these messages. He was heralding, he was proclaiming to Ahab what God had told him to say. People spiral down in one bad decision after another. And then as a result of all of the bad decisions they have made, when life doesn't go well, what do we find people doing? And maybe some of you have at one time in life been in this vicious cycle. Maybe somebody's in it today. You've made all these bad decisions. You have, you have gone down a wrong path. And suddenly you find it seems that everybody's your enemy, right? Everybody's your enemy. Everybody's against you. You are at odds. You are at war with anybody and everybody. If you're looking around in your life and you are fighting with everybody, maybe you should wake up and say, maybe the problem is with me. 
Maybe the problem isn't everybody around me. Maybe it's that I'm wrong and I don't want to, and I'm trying to blame it on everybody that moves around me. Very often a depressed person is a person who is at odds with everybody around them, especially those who are willing to tell them the truth. You see, sin deceives us, and it blinds us to, the re to this reality, causing us to lash out against those who truly care about us. It's easy to look horizontally. It's easy to look on the horizontal level of the people around me and to blame them for all of my troubles. And by the way, just because, think, just because things didn't go as you planned for them to go, just because something went wrong, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a blame. Sometimes just things don't go as planned. Don't blame somebody when, when something always goes wrong. Sometimes our knee-jerk, we just got to blame everybody because we don't want to look to ourselves. It's easy to look horizontally, but we need to be looking vertically. Looking vertically. What is God doing in my life through this disappointment? What is God doing in my life through this hard time? I'm not looking around to people around me. I'm looking to God. God, what is your word for me in this pain? Now, don't get me wrong. You know, we sometimes there are people that they just say, well, you know, I, I just speak the truth. I just tell it like it is, right? And when everybody, when, whenever somebody tells me that there's just a, a truth speaker that just tells it like it is and lays it out on the line, invariably, what do you find around that person? You find a battlefield of casualties because they're just out there truth telling with no grace whatsoever. They just think it, they say it, and that's it. Truth, what does Ephesians 4.15 say? It says truth must be spoken in love. Charles Stanley says that, uh, tr that, uh, that love is like a girdle for the truth. I didn't say, <laughs> not original, all right? He says sometimes you just, the, the truth just needs to be managed a little, needs to be tucked in a little bit. He says, you know, and, and you know, just because something is true, it doesn't always need to be said, does it? Sometimes it does need to be said, but just because something is true doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be said. If you come into church you know, about the holiday time right after Thanksgiving, you may have put on a few pounds. It doesn't mean that I need to recognize that, right? It doesn't, you know, you may, I may, you know, meet you for coffee and you may look horrible. I may look horrible. It doesn't mean that you need to say, Pastor, you look terrible today. What's going on? Just because something is true doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be said. Number three. Sin deceives with meaningless sorrow. We already saw that Ahab was sullen and displeased at the beginning of the chapter. At the end of the chapter, Elijah confronts him. Verse 27 describes uh, Ahab responding with outward signs of sorrow and contrition. The Bible says that hearing what, a what Elijah said, Ahab tears his clothes, he puts on sackcloth. What is that? You know, it's hard to, it maybe about like the modern equivalent of putting on burlap for clothes, just kind of scratchy and itchy and not comfortable at all. And for them, that was a symbol of mourning, a symbol of contrition and so the king puts on he tears his royal clothes he puts on sackcloth and he fasts and he's fasting for the first time and at least it appeared that Elijah made some headway with Ahab he, Ahab seemingly was sorry for, for his sin, but understand something. Although Ahab was sorry for his sin, it seems more that Ahab is sorry for the consequences. It's very easy for a person to be in sorrow about the consequences of their sin, maybe sorry that they got caught in their sin, while not truly sorry about the fact that they had sinned. We never see Ahab making any movement to restoring that property to Naboth's family. We never see Ahab making any public announcement that he is wrong for what he has done. We don't see that. Sorry for his sin, but he never truly repented. 
Reminds me of King Agrippa having heard the Apostle Paul. What did Agrippa say? He said, you have almost persuaded me to become a Christian. So close, so close, but not quite there. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. What's interesting also about Ahab's contrition, it's kind of shocking actually, that God responded even to a superficial contrition in Ahab. And God responded in mercy even to what God knew was superficial. That's God's grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Paul says to the Corinthian church, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So godly sorrow brings about a turning away from sin, a getting on a different path, walking away from sin. You may say, I've repented of my sin. If you're still sinning, you've not repented of it, okay? A person who says that they are a Christian and continues living, continues doing that which they know is not right, they have not repented. This is not a Christian There's a such thing as being sorry, but not repenting. Ahab may have feared death. Ahab may have feared hell, but he didn't love God. Nobody wants to go to hell. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but only the Christian loves God, wants to be with the Lord. You see, God works in your life and in my life in many different ways. One of the ways that God works is by sorrow and disappointment. Now, every disappointment, every sorrow, every pain is not always because of sin. One of the failures of Job's friends, when Job was suffering, they came to Job and said, Oh, you're in trouble. You're suffering. Things are not going well for you. Figure out what your sin is and it'll make it better. And the mess, one of the mess, clear messages of Job is difficulties are not always because of sin. But they are always an opportunity to lean on God, to look up to God, to pray that God would speak to us in the midst of our difficulty. We're going to find that many times our pain is because of some sin, something that God is seeking to purge from us. But it is always an opportunity regardless for us to get our eyes on God. God, what are you speaking to me? What is that megaphone that you are speaking in my deaf? to me about. We need to pray for tender consciences. We need to pray for tender hearts. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 speaks of God revealing himself to man, but man suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Man hearing the truth, knowing what the truth is, but they don't want to face it, so they're pushing it down because they're more interested in their unrighteousness. What's that an example of? It is an example of damaging our conscience. We need to pray for tender consciences. We need to be praying for that tender conscience they can't, uh, they can't stand the thoughts of defying God. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 speaks of those who have seared their consciences. Jeremiah in chapter 3 and in chapter 6 speaks of the terrible travesty, the terrible sentence on us when we get to the place when we've lost the ability to to blush. Wow. Is that not where we are as a country right now? Sin has become so commonplace. 
All, all types of wickedness and perverseness have become so commonplace that what used to bring us to the place of blushing these days, we hardly even give it a second thought. God help us. Oh, Lord, give us a tender conscience. That's what we need to pray. God, give me a tender conscience. God, don't let me put up with sin in my life. Lord, I want to be, and, and you know, every kid is different, right? And some of you, you've got, uh, you've got multiple kids, and maybe you've got one kid that they do what they do something that's wrong and you can punish that kid every way that you could possibly imagine and they just keep on trucking right unfazed you got that other kid that you just give them the stink eye and they melt right you know we need to pray lord help me to be the kid the child of god that melts at the stink eye of god that God can speak to me quietly by his spirit through God's word and I melt, I recognize I'm not right and I gotta get right. Lord, help me to have a tender conscience. Sin has Ahab in its death grip and it's dragging him deeper and deeper to the pit of hell by the day. He murders a man by false accusation and even worse, what a, how horrible is it that the accusation that they bring against Naboth is blasphemy against God? Who's the blasphemer? It's Jezebel and Ahab. And they accuse Naboth of exactly what they're guilty of. Another thing that's so vivid there, what do they say? Bring in the scoundrels. Bring in those worthless guys that we know can be bought. Bring in the bring in those uh, those pawns and just give them the job. Absolutely no respect for these people. Ahab and Elijah would never be together again. Ahab never allowed Elijah's message to truly turn him. In our times of sorrow, in our times of disappointments, the number one thing is not to try to drown it out by sleep, by food, by shopping, by endless you know, hours on end watching TV or going online just mindlessly. In our times of sorrow and disappointment, what do we need to do? We need to get to Jesus. We need to get to Jesus. We need to get to the cross. Maybe you're not saved and God is working through sorrow in your life to get you to the foot of the cross, to bow your knee in repentance and in faith and to know Jesus as your Savior. Jesus paid the price for your sins. Maybe your sin is what's brought you to that time of sorrow and disappointment. Jesus died for your sins so that you could be saved. What a wonderful thing it is to know that. Despite my faults, despite my failures, we can have peace with God, Romans 5, 2, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah for the cross. Christ is touched, Hebrews 7. Christ is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Get to Jesus in your times of trouble. But having done that, in your times of trouble, lean on people that are your true friends. Who are your true friends? Who are those people that down through the years have been steady, solid sources of spiritual benefit for you? Those are the people that might not always tell you what you want to hear, but they'll tell you what God's word says because they love you. You've got people like that in your life. You've got people like that. And there's no doubt in my mind that there are some of you right now that you, are, that you are casting off somebody who is the best friend you have. No doubt in my mind. It's amazing. And as a pastor, I feel this in a way that I never would have imagined preparing for pastoral ministry. It is shocking overwhelmingly shocking how fast I go from a person's best friend to their worst enemy. It can happen within a day. 
We can meet for coffee in the morning and we can be best friends. You love me. You appreciate me. You know what I'm telling you is the truth. And by the end of that day, you've blocked my number. And we never talk again. And I never get an answer on what happened. Just like that. I can't tell you how many times that's happened. I don't even want to tell you because I can't do, I can't go down that road without it being a really bad day of how many friends, people that I truly love to this day that I've lost because I went from being the best friend they had to being the worst of their enemies. Are you doing that to somebody today? You got people that love you, who love, who want to push you in the direction of the Lord. Get to Jesus first. Lean on those people. Lean on them. Be that for somebody else. Be that source. Be willing to be the enemy if you have to be so that you can love them and push them to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us. Sin is overwhelmingly deceitful. Sin catches us in its grips and takes us places that we never expected to go. Oh Lord, every person in this room faces that daily grind of temptation, of the deceitfulness of sin. Lord, would you get our eyes on Jesus today? And having our eyes on Jesus, I pray that you would help us to identify who our best friends are, who the people are in our lives that will truly point us to Jesus. Help us in turn to be that for somebody else. Dismiss us with your blessing now, Lord. Strengthen us spiritually because of the time we've spent in God's word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.